series of lectures that the procedure decided to hold in the memory of my father, who was the late president of Akhali Parsi and Juman for over 25 years. Uh, in my house, when he was there, he could actually set a clock by the way his discipline and punctuality worked. So getting up, having breakfast, leaving for work, coming back home, evening, tea, later on evening, whiskey, you know, dinner, everything was pretty much, you know, every day happened on time. And some old timers, they would remember trustee meetings, etc., would start back on time, you know, you know, finish by a certain time. So I'm very happy to hear, see that we all start also today on time, exactly at 12 o'clock noon as it was part of our program. You know, I was unfortunate not to have seen any of my grandparents and uh, 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 today when we were coming here in the car and we had our kids in the car with us and we realized that even uh, some of them uh, did not, I mean none of them saw my dad, right, because he passed away over 30 years ago when both me, neither me or my brother were married at that time. And today I think in this lecture when they are sitting here, they will understand something about what he was. Uh, the topics that we have chosen for for the lecture today, which our dear friend Justice Nariman will, will speak on, is Parsi law applicable to interfaith marriages. I have been married to a non-Parsi now for over 25 years. I was once on your show, I don't know if you remember, you had a show many years ago on television, right? And you questioned a lot about, I mean you questioned me specifically a lot about interfaith marriage at that time. And, uh, uh, you know, today, we, uh, when we see our community, we see that a large number of our community today is, is a mixed marriage couple, you know. I mean, uh, be, it, be it Delhi, be it, you know, even Bombay, you know, in Delhi we have a large number, but even in countries like Bombay and other places, we see that there's a lot of uh, Parsis marrying outside. And uh, today's talk, I think, would be very, very, you know, uh, enlightening for all of us to understand the law as to how does it apply to marriages of Parsis with, with non-Parsis. I won't take any more further time. I'd ask Mr. Kapadia to come up and uh, give the welcome address. Shavas Nargolwala was arguably one of the most eminent presidents that the Sanjuman has seen. He laid the very foundations for which we are all very grateful for. If you look at the rule book, the way it has been drafted very carefully with the precise nature of an ICS officer. We are delighted on two counts today. First, that Rohintan has agreed to deliver the Swatshyavas Nargolwala Memorial Lecture. Secondly, by the presence of uh, Honorable Minister for HR and Education to the Government of India, Madam, you and your family are very heartily welcome. It was in 1948 that two eminent Parsi Zoroastrians wrote two independent reports on the state of affairs of the Parsi community then. Even at that time, the decline in population was a matter of grave concern. Both made proposals of how to stem the rot. Unfortunately, not much has been done since then. Forty years later, I think my wife and I and our children took a drive through the cities of North India and the sadness which tinged my heart then still lingers. Property after property was lying desolate, unattended, no proper fencing, no proper wall, but uh, and that, unfortunately, is a state of affairs that the community has to tackle. We talk of Parsi Pano and Dokpanishi. Not very far from the Abu Road railway junction, there is what is left of a dogma. It's used as a trespass ground, people walk over it, around it, there's a marketplace. There are unconfirmed reports that an agari in Kolkata is used as a marketplace for selling electrical goods. I will refer to mixed marriages. Every second marriage in the community is outside the community. Uh, what do we do? Do we adapt? 
as we did when we first came to India, or definitely proceed towards a state which is terminal in its nature. We are therefore eager now to listen to Rohingya's talk, which I hope will offer some solution to the problem being faced by the community today. They promised to consult their colleagues and report. At a subsequent meeting, there was a unanimous request that he become the president, which he unhesitatingly accepted. The group assured him full cooperation and a free hand in the management of the affairs of the Anjuman. Knowing him, he would have not have had it any other way. Thus began a long and glorious innings of over 25 years as president, during which time he left behind a stamp of strong and purposeful leadership. Through his style was sometimes blunt, he was not lacking in flexibility. Under his stewardship, the Anjuman grew tremendously, and even today, although nearly 30 years have passed since his demise in a car accident, the legacy he left behind is strongly visible. Through his tireless efforts, he got the Kakra family to donate the seed corpus to build our Dari Mare in Delhi. He planned the structure and was there every single day to ensure its, time, its timely completion. The noteworthy stance he took on three religious issues showed his foresight, allowing non-Parsi spouses as members of the DPA, permitting non-Parsis to attend the dead ceremony of a Parsi, accepting children of interfaith marriages, and recognizing their Navjot ceremony as long as one parent was a Parsi. These were part-taking initiatives undertaken by him by forging consensus, and this has ensured the cosmopolitan nature of the Delhi Parsi Anjuman. He was a founder of the Federation of Parsis Rashtrian Anjumans of India and helped build the organization. During his time, it reached its zenith. Just before he passed away, he managed to get quite a large piece of land uh, approved behind our current Aramra, which I think today is going to be very useful for all of us. <laughs> uh, on his 100th birth centenary, we remember him fondly with a lot of respect, love and affection. Now, over to Mr. President, my dear friend Adil, my beloved parents, ladies and gentlemen, Shavaksha Nargolwala was indeed an institution. He was very dear to me and became dear to me by a somewhat curious incident. This took place ages ago when I was a student. He had some minor altercation with one of our community members and agreed with that member, look at his humility, that as president we should go to some community elder where the other gentleman could ventilate his grievance. The community elder was none other than my father who invited both of them for tea. They both came for tea. The other gentleman started off and finished in about five minutes. Shavaksha demolished him point for point within about three minutes flat, after which we had tea, after which we got into Western classical music of which both Shavaksha and I are great uh, aficionados. Shavaksha promised me that the very next day he would send out of his mammoth record collection, at that time it was some two or three thousand records, a set of the entire Heifetz recordings, including the early acoustic recordings from 1917 to 1955, which he promptly did the next day, after which we became the best of friends. We continued that great friendship till his untimely death in 1986. It was really untimely because he really st stewarded this organization for 25 years and we, we missed his leadership in the 
in the years which were without him. The topic for today is something which would have been very close to Shavaksha's heart. Shavaksha was a man of action. And among the other epithets that were applied to him were self-made and progressive. The latter epithet is what this whole talk is going to be about. First and foremost, it is important for us to ask ourselves a few questions. Who is a Parsi? Who is a Zoroastrian? Which community, the Indian community, to which community do we belong? Now, these questions have been asked through the ages. And it is first important to get rid of a few cobwebs. We have been told and repeatedly told as children that one of the promises that was made on our landing here to Jadi Radha was that we would not convert. Not only is this not correct, it would be absurd. Because as a refugee community, that's not something that is high up on the agenda. In fact, the five things that have been recorded through the ages by a priest called Darab Sanjana in 1599 AD, that is about eight centuries after it actually happened, tells us very clearly that our promises were as follows, that we would marry after sunset, which was the local custom of the day of that particular Yadav ruler, that we would adopt the Gujarati language, that our women would wear the sari, that we would not bear arms, we would not be violent, and that we would look after ourselves, that we would till the soil ourselves. Now, apart from this tradition, there is yet another tradition, which has also come down through the ages, recorded sometime in the 18th or 19th centuries in Gujarat. That is the tradition of the 16 Sanskrit shlokas that were learned by heart by our chief priest and repeated to the Brahmin priests on the shores of this great country to which we came sometime in the 8th century AD. Now, obviously, if we had been able to communicate through these 16 Sanskrit shlokas, none of which, by the way, again speak of conversion, except some interpolation which was apparently put into the 11th shloka long, long after. The important point to be gleaned from this again is that unfortunately for us, even our beautiful milk in the cup story does not seem to have come down through any tradition. In fact, it would be directly contrary to the tradition which said that we were able to communicate because milk in the, in the cup would necessarily be postulated on the fact that we could not communicate. That if milk was brought in a cup signifying that the entire milk, the cup was full and that this land didn't have any place for us. And our chief priest using his present of mind uh, apparently put some sugar in it. Unfortunately, again, does not... Uh, bear scrutiny from any of the oral traditions. So the first cobwebs out of the way are that in fact we had made a pledge when we landed here that we will not convert. No such thing. Second and more importantly, what does the Zoroastrian religion itself say on this? Now, all of you probably know that the Prophet existed at a time way before at least 600 BC. When exactly he existed, we don't know. But we know that he existed long, long before at least, let us say, 1000 BC. And long before most of the Jewish prophets, maybe at the time of Moses, maybe before. But what we do know is that when he preached the religion, not only did he expressly state that it was a universal religion for the whole of mankind, 
And for this purpose, he divided mankind into two parts. Those who live by the path of truth and those who don't. So all that was important to his central message was that everybody should join him in making this world a better place, a happier place for everybody else to exist in. And with this in mind, he went about the length and breadth, at least of Persia, as it stood then, spreading the word, which was spread in some 238 hymns, which fortunately for us have come down to us. Apart from the fact that his message was universal, we also happen to know that a Turanian, a man called Frayana, who is referred to in Yasnaha 46.12, was also somebody who came over to the faith. Now, whatever Frayana was, he was obviously not Iranian. He was Turanian. So, there is no problem about Zoroaster's time. There is not much of a problem about the succeeding generations either. As you all know, in recorded history, there have been three massive Persian empires. The Achaemenian, the Parthian, and then finally the Sasanian. And it was taken for granted that anybody who wished to come into the faith was most welcome. In fact, the excesses of one of the Sasanian emperors, Yazdegard II, in forcibly converting people in Armenia, which was contrary to the dogma of the religion, led unfortunately to a big backlash and Nestorian Christianity being established in that state. But what is important to realize is that throughout our history, and this has been documented and proved and stated and restated in book after book, is that it is clear that Zoroastrianism as a religion is a proselytizing religion. So point number one, it is a religion which, like the other great proselytizing faiths, believes in conversion. This is one very important fact that you must all know. Second, the question then was, what was the customary law in India? Because we've been in India now for 1300 years. Has anybody been converted on Indian soil? And if so, what was the reaction of the community? Now, this brings us directly to the Parsi law on the subject, which is really contained in two judgments. One is a judgment of 1909, consisting of a Parsi judge and an English judge of a division bench of the Bombay High Court. And another is of the year 1925, which arose from the birthplace of my father, Rangoon, which went all the way up to our Privy Council, which in those days was the equivalent of the Supreme Court of India. And it is these two judgments which I now intend to speak about in some detail, so that we first know what our law is, and after knowing what our law is, we must also see whether it is possible in this day and age to work within the law, in so far as mixed marriages are concerned. Now, first the Bombay judgment. The Bombay judgment arose out of the conversion of a French lady, none other than the mother of J.R.D. Tata. She was married, according to Christian rites, with R.D. Tata, a leading industrialist and wished to have her Navjot performed in Bombay. We are told by Rusi Lala, the chronicler of the Tata house, in the biography of J.R. D. Tata over the last Blue Mountain, that in point of fact, as many as 60 priests, most of them high priests, attended the Navjot in Mr. R. D. Setna's house, Mr. R.D. Setna, again being a financier, 
and a person close to the Tata household. We are told also that Dastur Jamas Pasa, who is the chief Dasturji of the Anjuman Atash Behram, one of the four holiest of holy fires in Bombay, actually performed the Naujot. After which, according to Zoroastrian rites, post the wedding, everybody had a little champagne and then went to sleep, as was customary in those days. Now, the whole question arose because Mrs. Tata, now being a practicing Zoroastrian, was brought to the family Agyari in Bandra, where I became a priest, incidentally. And the chief priest there said that, no, sorry, he could not admit her, because according to our law, she was a Juddin. And we must get this term again correct. A Juddin is somebody who is of a different religion. Deen is religion. Jud is Judo, separate. And since Juddins, therefore, could not be converted here, she was not permitted entry. Ardi Tata, being a gentleman, decided to test this in a court of law. He became the plaintiff number six in that particular case. And it, be, it was really the cause celebra in Mumbai in those times. A lot of evidence was taken of a number of priests. And ultimately, the court arrived at the conclusion that there were two ingredients to being a Zoroastrian, not just one. At least in so far as India is concerned. One is that you need to be born of a Parsi father, the ethnic component. And the second is that you need to be Navjotid, that is you need to become a Zoroastrian. You need to be born into the faith, so to speak. And they arrived at this conclusion by asking themselves a question which was not directly related to religion. The question they asked themselves for determination in that case was, put yourself in the place of the founders of each of the 28 trusts that were before them. Each of these founders lived in the 18th century in the 1700s. Each of them had something in mind when they said that the benefit of these trusts would go to persons who belong to the Zoroastrian community of Bombay, the Zoroastrian Majlis of Bombay, etc. Interestingly enough, the word Parsi was not used in any one of these 28 trusts. But the question remained, and the question was, put yourself in the place of this 18th century gentleman in the early 20th century, about 150 years after he was dead and gone. And if you put yourself in his place, what did he mean by these terms? Both the judges, the English judge with some hesitation, arrived at the conclusion that he'd have meant that somebody needs first to be ethnically a Parsi before he can become a Zoroastrian. Now, interestingly enough, as I told you earlier, priest after priest was examined and cross-examined on first what the religion said, what the Zoroastrian religion had to say about conversion. Most of them entered the witness box stating that the religion did not permit conversion. Every one of them finally left agreeing in cross-examination that far from forbidding conversion, it enjoined conversion. So the first important step taken in the case was Zoroastrianism is a proselytizing religion and believes in conversion. The second step, however, had also to be taken. What about Zoroastrianism on Indian soil? And here, three examples were put forward. 
The first example was of some pundits in the 11th century who are supposed to have converted to Zoroastrianism. The second was of Emperor Akbar himself. As you all know, Emperor Akbar was greatly taken up with almost every great world religion. And in particular, was taken up with a Sufi saint, a man called Tajuddin, and with the great Dasturji from Navsari, our chief priest, Dastur Mayar Jirana. These two apparently had an influence on him that even the Christian fathers in three successive stages did not have him. And it seems that when the community was told that the Sadra and the Kasti had actually been put on the emperor, there was jubilation. So, so far as Akbar at least is concerned, the fact that a Naujot was done on a complete Juddin and was accepted by the community was something staring at the court. The third interesting thing was some persons called the Mazagon converts who apparently were persons who were bastard children of Parsi fathers. And it seems they were not accepted but for a technical reason. They were not accepted, not because they were born of alien mothers or because they were illegitimate, but because no notice had been given to the Anjuman and things of that sort. So, we had three instances and both the judges looked at these three instances in, three very, in two very different ways. The Parsi judge, Davar, felt that none of them were proved on the evidence. The English judge, Beeman, felt that there was enough evidence to show, yes, that these three had taken place. And therefore, they arrived at divergent conclusions so far as this part was concerned. The Parsi judge, in fact, therefore held that even though the religion said, yes, please convert, in India, there was a negative custom that was proved. The negative custom being that on Indian soil, not a single conversion had, been, had taken place. And curiously enough, the Parsi judge referred to a particular judgment which said that child marriages were prevalent among the Parsi community of the day and were part of Indian customary law. Now, he relied upon this to say that since child marriages were prohibited in Persia, prohibited by the religion, one needs to have at least, at least attained the age of puberty, which in those days was 15. Yet, obviously, that particular law had fallen into desuetude here and it was replaced by an Indian customary law because then we took our cue from the majority community and allowed child marriage. On a lighter note, my great-grandfather was married to his first cousin when he was five and there was a delightful picture of the two of them on elephants in Surat, which unfortunately has been lost. Also, interestingly enough, because of this, a Parsi, Sir Temulji Nariman, who shares our surname, happens to be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest married life, 89 years. Because he married when he was five, his wife was three, and they both went on like good Parsis into their 90s. But coming back to the judgment, Justice Davar, therefore, clearly found that on the evidence, there was nothing to show any conversion had taken place on Indian soil. And therefore, this negative custom was proved just like infant marriages. Mind you, all this was said by Justice Davar after, in technical terms, dismissing the suit for want of maintainability. This, in ordinary language, only means that the suit as framed and brought to court could not go ahead at all. 
Now, why could it not go ahead at all? Because the person aggrieved, that is Mrs. Suni Tata, was not herself a suitor before the court. He should have stopped at that. And he knew that he should have stopped at that. Which is why he went on to say, however, days and days have been spent on this huge exercise. Therefore, if I don't say something about it, it won't look good. Now, Justice Dava's pronouncement, therefore, on its own showing, on the showing of the other judge and on the showing of the Privy Council later, was what we lawyers term as obiter dictum, which means something which does not form, form part of the judgment of the court, something which is, in a sense, unnecessary to arrive at the judgment of the court, because the ultimate judgment of Justice Dava was suit not maintainable. The English judge, on the other hand, first held that the suit was maintainable for reasons given by him with which we are not concerned. And then went on to discuss the merits of the controversy. Now, as I told you earlier, interestingly enough, the English judge found on the evidence that yes, there does appear to have been these three occasions on which persons were brought into the Zoroastrian fold on Indian soil. But he strongly denied that there is anything like a negative custom in law. He went on to state that if at all there is some custom here, it is the fact that the idea of conversion was ever present to the community in its sojourn in India. Now, how did he say that? He said that because of the very fact that these three conversions had taken place on the evidence as, 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 uh, as produced before the court and on consulting what are called the rivayats. Now, this is a little important because whenever we had any difficulties which we faced on religious rights and practices in India, the country that is Persia, and we sent him with questions, and that gentleman came back with answers from the chief priest, let us say, in Yazd. Now, here there are three rivayats which speak unequivocally on the subject, and they're all very important. The first is a rivayat of a man called Nariman Hoshang in the year 1478 AD. Nariman Hoshang is sent by the community here and among the questions that he asks are two very important questions. The first is, if slave boys and girls, that is our servants, who are not Zoroastrian, are actually serving us, would it be permissible or proper to admit them into the religion? The answer that he got was unequivocally yes from the chief priest in Yazd. The other question that he asked was, suppose somebody goes out of the religion, there is already a practicing Zoroastrian, and for some reason he walks out, maybe he walks into another faith or just walks out. Would it be proper to readmit him? Again the answer was in the positive, yes. It is your duty, in fact, provided the various rituals, etc., are properly performed and provided that gentleman is genuine in wanting to come back. We move on now to the year 1599 AD, where somebody called Kaus Mayar was also sent with a rivayat. And his rivayat was, suppose we have persons who are grave diggers, that is obviously persons who belong to the Muslim and Christian communities, corpse burners, persons who belong to the majority community here, and darwans. Now, a darwan, strictly speaking, is a person who walks away from the faith. But what was meant here perhaps was Juddin. 
So the, the question was unequivocal. The question was, suppose there are persons of other faiths, to put it in a nutshell, and suppose they want to come into the religion, what do we do? Again, the answer comes from Persia. And the answer is yes, you must ad admit them into the faith, provided no harm comes to Bedins thereby. Bedins be practicing Zoroastrian in India. So this was the second revival on this ticklish question. The third was a revival of 1773. So you see it spans quite a period, 1478, 1599, now 1773. And this is called the Itotep Rivayat or the Rivayat of 78 different questions. The 13th question, again, was framed in a peculiar way. The question was, suppose you have, perhaps following the first Rivayat, admitted your servants into the Zoroastrian faith, would it be correct to consign them to the Towers of Silence? Answer given again from the chief priest in Yazdis. Not only would it be correct, but if you did not do so, it would be a terrible sin. So, the riwayats as a body of customary law, which may or may not be followed in India, that's a different point seem also to point to the same direction. The mother country was never wavering in its approach to the religion. And the mother country always stated, yes, you must, but with a few caveats, the most important caveat being, don't do anything that would harm you because you are, after all, a refugee community here. Now, having said all this, Justice Beeman then goes on asks himself the same question, suppose I put myself in the place of the original founder of the trust, what would I do? And says, yes, I would perhaps arrive at the same conclusion. But in saying this, he goes on to say something very interesting. He alone uses the word caste. And he says, because of the majority community here and because we have adopted their ways, like them, we have become a caste. And a caste is something hard and fast, becomes very difficult. It's an exclusive club. Either you are born in it or you are not. And he said that having said this, I must still state that the question really arises on the wrong foot. Because the question arises this way. Do we admit persons much lower to us in status into the religion. Had the question been put the other way, perhaps the answer might have been different. And he puts it beautifully when he says that for every one Akbar that may be converted, there'd be a hundred low caste people waiting in line. Therefore, shut the door altogether. Another very interesting thing the English judge says, is that if I were to put myself in the place of that founder, and let's say a community of elders in, in the Parsi community were to, on a case-by-case -case basis, look at somebody and say, yes, he deserves admittance. Of course, the founder of that trust would admit it. Now, this is so far as the Bombay judgment is concerned. One other very important thing the judgment held, before I go on to tell you what should logically follow or not follow from it, is that therefore now there were three categories of persons who are part of the Parsi Zoroastrian community, so to speak. The first category belongs to those original descendants who came here and their progeny. The second belongs to those Irani Zoroastrians who have come over in the recent past, who will also be given admittance and treated as if they were Parsi Zoroastrians. And the third, and this is very important, Parsi Zoroastrian children 
that are born of Parsi fathers but alien mothers. Now, the third category was really a great advancement made in the law in the year 1909. And let me tell you why. The judgment of Justice Dava refers specifically to a meeting of the elders of the community in the year 1905. Get your dates right again. 1903 was the conversion of Mrs. Sunitata by Anaujot. 1905 is this meeting of the community asking themselves whether children of non-Parsi mothers should also be allowed. The unequivocal answer was no, they should not. And therefore, only children born of both a Parsi father and a Parsi mother should be give, given admittance. 1905. 1906, the suit was filed in Bombay and 1909 came the judgment. Now, the important advance made in the judgment is the third category. Because despite the fact that the community in 1905, just four years before the judgment, said that nobody of an alien mother should also be allowed, in 1909, both judges were agreed that this formed a third category. One very important thing. And secondly, if I were to ask myself the question, Put yourself in the place of that 18th century gentleman who founded these trusts. Would he have regarded Mrs. Suni Tata as a member of the Zoroastrian Majlis, so to speak? My answer would be yes. And for the following reason. Mrs. Suni Tata was first and foremost a European lady. Now, being a European lady, in terms of caste or class status, she was above us, at least in those days. And second, and more importantly, she was married to one of the most prominent businessmen who belonged to the community. Which is why as many as 60 priests came forward to do her Navjot. Would those gentlemen who founded the trusts in the 18th century have admitted this European lady married to a most prominent businessman? My answer would unhesitatingly be yes. And if that were so, then our entire law would have moved on a completely different course. But what is important is that even on the judgment as it stands, how do you accept children of Parsi fathers who have married alien mothers when the community itself rejected something like this? You can possibly do this only on the ground that you would have to apply a forward-looking contemporary community standard. Now, if you are to apply this forward-looking and contemporary community standard, you would perhaps arrive at the conclusion that children born of a Parsi father, of a mother who happens to be from some other community, should nonetheless gain admittance. The very fact that the community rejected it in 1905 but, as we know, accepted the judgment thereafter, shows us that given the time of the judgment, it was both progressive and correct. We are today over a hundred years down the line. Don't forget, Bombay in 1909 and Bombay today are worlds apart. The Bombay of 1909 was a very stratified Bombay where each one belonged strictly to his community and did what his community wanted of him. The Bombay of today is like any one of the great cosmopolitan cities of the world where everybody comes across everybody else and we are all part of one huge diaspora, the result of which is 
the increase in mixed marriages that have taken place. This being the case, therefore, at least two important things follow from the English judge's judgment, Justice Beeman's judgment. One is the formulation, perhaps in some case in the future, of some contemporary standards test, which would take in what is required by the felt need of the times. And second, equally, the test of some committee of elders, because this is something that this great judge thought of in the year 1909, that when it comes to persons who have married out, and the, the obvious thing is, we are not talking about wholesale conversion. We are only talking about spouses and their children. Now, the problem is that there is really a double whammy in practice. And what do I mean by this? Because of the 1909 judgment, Parsi father who marries a woman from another faith, his children can become Zoroastrian, but the lady is kept out. The lady brings up the children. So that even though the children may well be Navjotid, ultimately, who knows what they grow up to be. And equally, the Parsi girl who marries out and who wants to retain her faith is not only regarded as out, perhaps wrongly, even under our law, but our ch children certainly are regarded as out. So the net result is that in cities like Bombay, Bangalore, Chennai, Calcutta, all the big cities of this country where most of us are, the double whammy in fact comes into place. And the result is by and large that all children of mixed marriage couples ultimately are lost to the community. What then is the way out? The Privy Council, the second judgment, again shows us that the door is not slammed shut. There is some slight opening. And this brings me now to the second judgment. The second judgment was again concerned with a girl called Bella, who apparently was born of some Goan gentleman called Jones and allegedly a Parsi lady. Nobody really knew whether her mother was or was not Parsi, but allegedly Parsi. She was handed over to somebody in Rangoon who in turn handed her over to his brother. Her parents died and that good Parsi brought her up as his own child. At age 14, he had her Navjotid by none other than the great chief priest of Pune at that time, who was uh, Kekobad uh, Dastur. And when he wanted to bring her into the Agyari, there was a problem to start with. But then on the invitation of the priest, she was brought in and she was permitted to behave like any other Zoroastrian child. This being the case, three members of the community went to court on behalf of the community. The trustees didn't go to court. And again wanted an adjudication of this very question. Lord Philemon, speaking for the board, another Englishman, went into the Daver Beeman judgment in some detail, said with a little hesitation and some reflection that he would ultimately follow their definition of Parsi Zoroastrian, namely the dual qualification, the ethnic and the religious, and apply it to a completely different factual circumstance. The factual circumstance this time being a government grant. You remember, in the Dava Beeman judgment, we had 28 trust deeds. All the lands that were dedicated were private lands. In Bella's case, we had government land dedicated and dedicated this time 
specifically for a Parsi fire temple. This was the language used. The word Parsi comes here as it didn't occur in the 28 earlier trust deeds. The judges felt that this was really the same thing in the sense that one had to discover what was meant by the Parsi stroke Zoroastrian community of Rangoon and therefore said they would apply the two dual face. But they didn't stop there. One can see on a reading of the judgment that they were uncomfortable with their decision. They reversed not only Justice Young who was in the lowest court, but also the chief court. And the chief court had held that yes, there is a dual qualification, but since trust deeds refer really to religious and not ethnic purposes, it is enough that you are Zoroastrian. You need not be Parsi. This got reversed. Now on reversing it, the judges went on to state, we want to make a distinction between community purposes such as worship, right of worship and property. And they said that the moment there is property under trust, you cannot admit a single foreign beneficiary, so to speak. Suppose the property is in form of amounts that are to be doled out. No person other than those who belong only to the Parsi Zoroastrian community can get a farthing. But in a case like community worship, so long as Bela, who is now Naujoted and a Zoroastrian, does not significantly disturb members of the community, does not create a nuisance, and so long as there are not too many Belas that land up at the same time, the trustees of an institution have the discretion, this is very important, to admit such children. What was expressly rejected by the Privy Council is also very important. The plaintiffs came with a case to the court that the very entrance of a person like Bella would amount to desecration of the temple. Desecration was rejected by the Privy Council. This is important to bear in mind. The door was not slammed shut, but kept slightly ajar. And this door which is kept slightly ajar has in fact inured to the benefit of certain anjumans, which if I may say so are forward looking like ours, where under the stewardship of President Shavak's Narvan Nargolwala and many succeeding him, I am informed that the trustees have in fact taken a decision and do in fact permit the children of Parsi girls were married out at least to avail of our fire temple. What then therefore is the way out today? Can we go to a court of law and say these judgments are wrong? Can we say that they are wrong because they are unconstitutional? I don't think so. I think it may perhaps be better to work within them. And the way out may be short, of course, of an institution which is set up today by some big philanthropist who may believe generally in the Zoroastrian, the larger Zoroastrian cause, where he specifies in his trust deed that this is meant not only for ethnic Parsis, but for Zoroastrians worldwide, short of setting up any such institution. The answer perhaps lies in the judgments of the two English judges, Justice Beeman and Justice Philemon in the Privy Council. The answer that we get from Justice Beeman is, first and foremost, why not have a community of elders to go on a case-by-case -case basis in order to determine whether the person is genuinely interested in coming into the community or is doing it for some oblique purpose. The moment there's a doubt, reject such person, no difficulty. That flows from Justice Beeman's judgment. And what flows from Lord Philemon's judgment is, 
that if even one institution like the Delhi Parsi Anjuman in let's say Bombay or Bangalore or Pune or Ahmedabad or any of the other big cities were to follow suit and to say that at least so far as girls who have married out, their Navjotic children should be allowed, that would again be within the discretionary, the, the discretion allowed by Lord Philemon to the trustees of each institution, institution by institution. And this now brings me to the last part of the talk, which is what happens to girls who marry out, who let us assume may have married out under the Special Marriage Act and therefore not given up the religion, but done, let us say, a fera, the seven steps, saptapadi, around the fire, or done a nika, or had a church marriage. Have they given up their faith? That seems to me to be a matter again for the courts and for evidence in each given case. But having said so, on the assumption that there is a per se test, which is that the moment you do the feras, the moment you have a nikah, the moment you have some ceremony, which is a religious ceremony outside, you are deemed to have given up your religion. We come to two very important things that have been told to us, one by the rivayats, which I have adverted to earlier, and one by the singular case of Mr. Neville Wadia. All of you must be in the know that Mr. Neville Wadia, at age 83, was admitted into the Zoroastrian faith, having been born into the Anglican Church. How did this happen? His father, Sir Ness Wadia, married an English lady and converted to the Anglican faith even before Neville was born. Neville was therefore born into the Anglican faith. Having been so born and having been a member of that faith for 80 odd years, in the twilight of his life, he honestly felt, having studied the religion, that he wished to have his Navjot done. And again, being a gentleman like R.D. Tata, consulted the chief priests. Five to two, five learned chief priests said there was nothing wrong and that they ought to admit him. And in fact, they admit, admitted him. So that his case shows us two other very important things. One, that so long as you are born of a Parsi father, even though you are not ever admitted into the Zoroastrian faith, at any time before you, are di before you die, you may be Navjotin. And he was, in fact, Navjotin at age 83. And equally interestingly, the fact that he was never Navjotin would not stand in the way. So therefore, the answer now to be applied from Neville Vadia's case and from the Rivayat, which if you remember, specifically said, if persons go out, can you bring them back? The answer was yes. On the assumption that these girls have gone out, because they have in fact undergone some ceremony or the other in some other faith, I would say it would be very easy to bring them back. Provided, of course, they file an affidavit and they say they genuinely wish to come back and they have their Naujot redone again. That would obviate all difficulties in their way and would permit such girls to come back to the mainstream of Zoroastrianism, either never having left it or having left it for some other purpose, which may be oblique or otherwise. With this, I end my talk and only hope maybe against hope, that the community looks a little forward. The law was progressive, both in 1909 and in 1925. 
let us try and work with it within it and be as progressive as they were when applied to the fact situation as it obtains today thank you very much The object of this talk is a little different. The object of this talk is to deal with what we have within our community at present. If you will notice, the Neville at Vardia example was taken because despite the fact that Sir Ness, his father, had become Christian before he was born, he fulfilled the very first qualification, the ethnic qualification that he was born of a Parsi father. So it would not perhaps be correct to say that the Neville Vadia instance could be torn out of context and would be allowed to apply to persons who had absolutely no ethnic contact with the faith at all. Second, the reason Neville Vadia was used as an example was only so that if girls have in fact gone out on their marriage, what is the way out? The way out is to bring them back. So it was only with this in mind that the example was given, not as I had repeated earlier, to open the doors wide. Yes. Yes. That's not what I said. What I said was, if you put yourself in the place of any member of the Parsi community in 1903, which is when she was Navjotin, and you, to, you were to ask that member, would you accept Mrs. Suni Tata to be part of your community or would you not? The answer probably would be yes, because... Being a European in 1903 meant that she belonged to a strata of society slightly higher than us. That is what I say. As perceived in 1903. And if that were so, combined with the fact that she was married with one of the most prominent industrialists in the community, would almost make it conclusive to say yes. Just as Akbar, for example, in the 1570s, was received with jubilation in Nausari after a Sadra and Kasti was put on. I could even think of examples like Akbar and bring them down the line. Take Queen Victoria. Now suppose Queen Victoria had a servant called Rustam instead of Abdul. You remember Abdul was her favorite from whom she took almost any liberty. And suppose Rustam was a Parsi priest. And suppose Rustam made it clear to her that Zoroastrianism was something fantastic and she accepted. What do you think the community would have said? <laughs> yes. And one more. Come to modern times. Come to Mrs. Indira Gandhi. Suppose she wanted to gain entrance. I have no doubt that all the elders and all the chief priests, etc., would, at least from their point of view, bend every rule to bring her in. Yes. Yes, please. You very rightly said that uh, the rule is given by Justice Beeman and Elmos. We should try and work within that. Yes. Now, my query is that supposing there is a tricky situation uh, and you work a solution within the framework laid out historically and within these rulings, yeah. who would put a final stamp of acceptance on that? You see, the community. The answer is the community, not courts of law. You see, the, an the answer is very important. The question is very important. The idea of working within the law is that we don't have to go back to the law. 
You follow? So the idea is not to go back to the law. The idea is to take from the law as it stands cues, so to speak. And when we take these cues and work within it and work harmoniously within it, that perhaps would be a way out. Yes. Uh, if you had a civil marriage, okay, whoever two people had a civil marriage, if they're married, now the next marriage you do 10 days later, to my mind it's a tamasha, it's not a marriage. So how does the pharaohs done after the civil marriage affect anything? Because once you're married, you're married, you can't get married over and over again. That's just for the public. So then why would the pharaohs or, uh, or our ceremony, anything that is done for public consumption, you already married. If I follow. Yeah. The answer given to you is, in the words of a very, very great, one of the greatest ever U.S. Supreme Court judges, Justice Holmes, that the life of the law is not logic but experience. You see, logic often fails and experience often teaches us that though something may be wrong, it is something that is accepted. Now, the answer therefore to be given to you is, that whether a fera is or is not taken, we'll assume that now it is taken and we assume also that what you say is correct and equally what the opposite side says is correct. We assume that both of you are correct. The trouble is, what would a court of law do? A court of law would, I mean, it's a possible view, your view is a possible view, the other side's view is an equally possible view. A court of law could perhaps go this way, could perhaps go the other. The answer therefore is not whether you are right or the other side is right. The answer is something different. The answer is assume the other side is correct. There is a very simple way out. The way out is to navjot the person again. Yes, it would apply to boys and girls equally. Of course it would. If a boy does a fera after he has been married and all, then again yes. he should have the navjot Yes. Yes, if there is a challenge, if there is a challenge in a court, it would have to be met. You are right. But you say we are a proselytizing religion. You are implying that the reply given by the head priest from the and the prior is considered as sanctified by the faith. No, it is not. You see, no, you see, we, no, we are not going on any assumption. The only reason the riwayats were brought in again in my talk and the reason that the answers were given to you in such detail was to tell you two things. One is that the religion itself definitely says proselytize, first. The second is, that it would not be correct to say that there is any negative custom in this country. The negative custom being that because nobody has been converted on Indian soil, out goes conversion. There was enough in this country for persons to ask repeatedly that look, we have servants. And that's why the English judge correctly says, started on the wrong foot in terms of caste, in terms of class, it started on the wrong foot. You see? When it starts on the wrong foot, what happens is you get the wrong answer. But despite that, you got the right answer from there, from the mother country. The mother country has never flinched in saying, yes, you must. And by the third riwayat, if you remember, the first riwayat was 1478, the third was 1773. By the time of the third riwayat, there were servant boys and girls who had in fact already been given the faith. And the question was a different question. The question was, having been given the faith, are they entitled to go to the Rakma or not? So, the object of quoting the riwayats is only to say that there was no negative custom in this country. And since there was no negative custom, any conclusion based on such negative custom is incorrect. To property rights of those who are supposed to be given the permission to convert. 
No. Not directly. No. Which is why the all important distinction is made by the Privy Council between property rights and community worship rights. This door is ajar under the Privy Council judgment only for community worship rights, not property rights. Yes. And converts to the religion in Canada or any such place where it's allowed to do that. Yes. And when he comes back to India or she comes back to yeah. India. And what is their position then as far as the Parsi or India are concerned? Exactly the same position as any other person who is not born of a Parsi father. So what happens? Can, can no, he cannot. Go into the side no, he cannot. Into the national law. Maybe. But there's a dual qualification. Ethnic is Parsi father. He cannot. Yes. No. That he can do under the Bella judgment. Yeah. Because then it is up to trustees of an institution. Okay. Okay. Yes. So that has been in the, uh, right. So that has happened. Secondly, on the issue of uh, the constitution allowing for gender equality, why should a girl who is married outside not have the same rights as a boy who is married outside? All right. So can that be a, a, a reason for? Yeah, I have to answer that. You see, it is answered by saying gender equality is contained in Article 15, if you have ever read our constitution. Now, Article 15 says that only certain institutions, which does not include temples, least of all private temples, like public roads, public tanks, public wells, etc., persons can use without discrimination as to sex. So the answer is, Number one, Article 15 doesn't cover temples. Number two, all religious rights of a particular community otherwise are preserved. Subject to only three exceptions, public order, morality and health. So that if the state makes a law which interferes, and mind you, unlike Article 15, the rest of the fundamental rights chapter is only citizen against state, not citizen against citizen. 15 can perhaps go, so far let us say as a public tank is concerned, to a citizen against another citizen who obstructs you. But all the other articles including 25, 26 which deal with religious rights are that you have given your religious rights as they stand today and as they stand under the two judgments therefore. Subject to parliament making a law in the interest of public order, morality or health. So the constitution doesn't take you forward at all. You kept referring, you kept referring. Okay. Just, just one minute, just he wants to ask. Us. You kept referring, say go back to the 18th century person who set up the trust fund. I have a very basic question. What if you went back 10,000 years ago to the prophet Zoroaster? What would he have said? His, he was very clear. He said unequivocally time out of number in the Gathas, that this is a universal religion. So and somewhere we lost that message of the Prophet. And we not somewhere, in this country we lost it. It's in this country. Yes. Not somewhere. Ava, would you mind if he asks a question? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. States do it acceptance. Yeah. And states still keep promoting intermarriage. Yeah. Which is what I have been observing, you know, all the time. This is one comment I want You may be right as to one and two, I don't know about three. Of course it would. Similarly, you cannot say that uh, Akbar was converted into uh, Parsi by that same uh, concept. 
Yeah, that's a good point. No, no, one, one minute. That's a very good point because what you are saying is the fact that he accepted this didn't mean that he accepted it exclusively. That's your point. You put your point a little differently. He accepted every faith, including this. That's a good point, yes. I have a question. Sorry. No, sorry. No, you please ask because you haven't asked yet. Yes. My question is if uh, a case like this comes up in court, will you recuse yourself? Yes. Go <laughs> <laughs> without saying. Yes. yes. I have, I have certain strong views. Yes. The lady that I have brought in the context of gender equality. Yes. And you speak of, uh, you speak of studying the prophet's words as they were. Yes. Uh, amongst the many myths that you've broken today, you speak about sugar in the milk cup of milk story. Yes. Uh, I recall, possibly incorrectly, a book that I read in Bombay by Nehem after Moose. who spoke about uh, the prophet saying that a girl who's giving birth to a child out of wedlock also is ought to be respected and protected. Prophet said no such thing. Because what the only body that we have of, of literature we have from the Prophet is the Gatha. And in the Prathas the Prophet has said no such thing. So in terms of uh, gender equality and the way you conceptualize the fundamental rights, uh, and you rightly say that it's limited to public uh, wells, tanks, etc. That again would only be to the state making laws. Yes. Is it? That is not true. Now which that parliament is going to uh, which parliament will make a law affecting a minority community? That's why it's very <laughs> very difficult. Very difficult. But but one more very important thing. Yes, the prophet was extremely progressive and he did not speak only of men. Often in his great lectures. He always spoke of men and women. He always used the expression men as well as women. Those who have come to hear me, men and women, constantly. Can many of these issues not be decided by community? It's very difficult. Who will take, take the vote? Which is, which the, is the authority, authority that takes the vote? What's the community, What's the community, community at large? Well, all those are not excluded very difficult. You see, these, you see, things, these are things are gradual. gradual. They don't they happen, don't happen at, 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 at one at one fell at one, at one, at one, at one in point, in of, point, of, point time. of time. There has, there to, has be to be a gradual, gradual change. change and, and the gradual, gradual change, change can, occur can occur and, and can hasten the, the process. If in if fact you have institutions which are set up today for all forests. Once that happens, that happens perhaps, perhaps a sizable size body, body will go over there, there. And then and there will be some chunk within the community, which will bring about a certain result in, in between. between. An example is like the modern law. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Rointon, uh, Indian laws is what you spoke. And we say that across the road, any non parsi cannot go into the Atas Biram. But when I went to Canada, there is a board which says, this is a Zoroastrian temple. All people are allowed because that country allows. My, mine is not a question, what happens because we were Hindustan earlier, what is happening today in Pakistan? Do they follow the same that we are doing here or they follow what Canada follows? They we follow what we are doing here. They follow what we are doing. They don't convert. I think lunch is beckoning us. Yes, <laughs> when, do we, when do we get a chance? Tell her, tell her. The last question. Would you then Yes, I have one question. You can say okay. uh, that uh, uh, you talked about that chink in the city council judgment which, is, which gives discretion to the trustees so that the, what the Delhi Parsi argument is doing is under that. Absolutely. So it is legal Absolutely. as far as we are allowing the children. Absolutely. You just said it's illegal, so please clarify. Yes, I know. No, I didn't just say it's illegal. No, no. And this is the clink we are No, no, no. Cyrus's query was persons who are of a completely different faith, not persons born of a Parsi mother. 
पारसी मदर नो पारसी मदर इज ऑब्विस्ली लीगल शी इज बॉर्न ऑफ आर पारसी फादर हर चिल्ड्रन इज लीगल अंडर द प्रिवी काउंसिल जजमेंट प्रोवाइडेड ट्रस्ट इज लाइक दीज एक्सरसाइज दे डिस्क्रेशन यस नो नो आंसर नो ओनली हियर एंड एनी अदर इंस्टीट्यूशन विच मे पर बी इन जमशेदपुर आई डोंट नो यजर मे बी एबल टू आंसर यस ग्रे एरिया बट एज फार एज आई नो ओनली डेली 